morning. We would like to welcome you to the uh, church service. We haven't seen you for a long time, and uh, we are glad to see you. Uh, the new quarters are in the back over there, and uh, you can feel free to get uh, one for the next uh, Sabbath. Um, the tithe and offerings, we're going to have uh, bags in the back al also. At the end, you can uh, deposit your offerings and your, uh, your tithe uh, and the children also offering. Um, and we want to encourage you to come to the Bible study or to listen by, by uh, the phone. I have uh, been blessed uh, uh, by marking the number and putting the code, and then I hear pastor preaching and sharing with us uh, portions of the Bible. So we encourage you to keep connected uh, and in that way. Um, Church informated information updates. If you are a member who has not been receiving our information text and would like to be added to our list, uh, please uh, talk to or you can call Bobby Tucker and uh, uh, to that phone that is there, and uh, she will include you in the list. Okay. Um, let's have the invocation at this moment. I would like to invite you to stand up. Our dear Heavenly Father, we raise our voices in gratitude for the many blessings, for the Sabbath, for the rest, for the blessings that you have stored for us. Thank you for being here this morning, and thank you for seeing our members, uh, some of them uh, in, in the church. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us as you uh, prepare our hearts to the message that you have prepared for us. Be with us, be with the rest of the members in their homes, Heavenly Father. Those who are ill, we pray that you will bring your touch in, uh, healing touch in on them, and they will be able to uh, unite with us again. Uh, we pray that uh, you will bless us as we contemplate the plan that you have for us. Uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can sit down. Have a seat. Um, now we are going to have uh, a, a video on stewardship at this moment. How can we help your children develop wise management of their resources and to invite God into their financial life? Let's see what Ellen G. White suggests that parents and teachers should make the study of figures something practical very early in children's lives. Children should learn through practice how to rightly use money. This money may be supplied by the parents as an allowance or be earned by the child. It should be used to purchase their clothing, books, and other necessities. They must be taught how to select and purchase those necessities. They must keep an account of their expenses a report of expenses is strongly encouraged, which could result into getting the next allowance. If they are taught to put God first, they will choose, tithe, and promise as the first two actions after any new income is received. Then their savings will be the next, all before any other expenses may be met. It will lead them to a life of simplicity and frugality more in line with a Christian lifestyle. Ellen G. White also says that teaching those lessons at a young age will not only encourage habits of benevolence, but will also teach them how to give, not from the mere impulse of the moment, but regularly, systematically, and will help them to remember who is the source of their income, linking their hearts to the one who is the real provider by providing an allowance and this kind of education, parents are preparing their children not only to have a more successful life on this earth, but also eternal life. As you return your tithes and promise, pray for the younger generations of the church. May we put our desires last and God first.
Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good. I love the energy. That was a wonderful video made by our Seventh-day Adventist folks um, for our stewardship, our tithe and offering. We want to encourage you to continue with those. Um, I know sometimes some people are suffering with this COVID issue, but um, we're seeing that um, the membership is still faithful and it's still doing its part. Amen. So at the very end of um, the church out there in the foyer, we have a children's offering box. And we have our tithe and offering box, and you're certainly, um, you know, welcome to leave those on your way out. So we do have, this is the children's story segment, and we have a children's story. Unfortunately, our kids are not here with us today, but you know what? We can always learn something, because we were kids once ourselves, right? We all, all the adults that are here this morning. Yeah, pardon me? Yes. Yes, and ex absolutely, and online we have, I'm sure, some kids that are going to be watching and hearing us, so um, definitely, so I want to share a little story with you guys this morning, and it's about this little girl that just loved to play the piano. How many here enjoy playing the piano, would have loved to maybe have that gift or talent to have played? I wish I could have played the piano, so I certainly enjoy it. Well, this little girl loved the piano, and all she could play was chopsticks. Do you guys know what that song is? Right, we all know what the chopsticks is, that's right. So she was playing chopsticks, and well, that's all she could play, and her parents um, actually realized that she wanted to someday be a great pianist. So they were like, well, we're gonna have to get her some help. So they decided to get together and, um, um, and hire a maestro and get her some lessons, okay, so that she can improve on her skills. Um, so they hired this uh, maestro, and it was time for them to finally take her for her first lesson. So when the little girl and the parents arrived at the maestro's beautiful home, it was a very large mansion, they were greeted by a butler. And the butler escorted them to this big living area where they were able to sit down. And as he was trying to let them know, the parents and the little girl, what where they could sit and stuff, the little girl noticed there was this beautiful grand piano in the area, and guess what she did? Does anybody know what a child would do if they see something they like? Absolutely, she just dashed towards that piano, and she sat on the piano, and what did she start playing? Chopsticks, chopsticks the only thing she knew how to play. So she started playing chopsticks on the piano. Her parents were so embarrassed. They were like, oh no. And just at the moment that they were about to approach her and get her to, you know, get off this beautiful grand, grand piano, um, the maestro came in. And he sort of like made a gesture and told the parents, like, let her be. And he just said, oh, yes, continue. He kind of encouraged her to continue what she was doing, right? So what do you think he did as he stood there watching this little girl play his beautiful piano. Does anybody have an idea of what he could have done? Absolutely, he joined in with her. So he sat next to her and he listened for a few minutes and then he started playing along. So he added to her chopsticks and the parents were like, wow, they were impressed that this, this maestro would like play along with a child that's playing chopsticks. How could that be? But it was. And so together they played a beautiful tune. You know, sometimes, right, we may feel that we may not have accomplished something great. You know, we may think um, that we haven't really done much in life, that maybe we're just not that great of a person or we haven't gone as far as we would have liked to have gone. But then when you look at this little girl and you see the fact that she started off playing chopsticks, something very, very basic. And yet, this maestro came right next to her and he sat next to her and then he joined her. We can see how in life, right, we may start with something that is not very big or very accomplished or very developed, but we know that we have someone who's going to sit right next to us and play right along with us. And who is that going to be? Who? That's going to be Jesus, our Savior. So um, we have to remember that even though at times we, we may feel as adults now or as children 
that, oh, well, I don't know how to play the piano all that great, or I'm not good at sports, or I'm not good at soccer, or baseball, or I don't even have a, a great amount of dolls or something. Who knows what a child is thinking, right? But we know that God is always there for us to encourage us and to be part of that growth, okay? So um, we just want to let you know as we round the story to, to an end, that God gives us abilities and he gives us gifts and he gives us so many things that we can use for him, you know, and to encourage others and to grow ourselves. So remember this little girl as she started playing the chopsticks, but she was encouraged to continue and to grow and to develop. And um, we need to also um, think the same way. So we may feel sometimes that we're still at the chopstick stage but, you know, we need to feel encouraged to continue and just keep going because God has a whole world out there that we can be part of and that we can contribute to. So may the Lord bless you. But as I finish, I wanted to read to you really quick a verse found on Mark 10, 27. And it says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. First Chronicles says, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And finally, Philippians says, I can do all things through him who gives me, who gives me, that's right, and we need to have strength each and every day. May the Lord bless you, and I know this was a children's story, but we can all certainly learn from these stories. Thank you so much. May the Lord bless you. I'd like to invite you to kneel down as possible uh, for the prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your blessings today. We want to thank you that you brought us uh, to the church safely. Amen. And uh, we want to ask you that uh, you will keep us safely from this uh, pandemic, Heavenly Father. Uh, we want to ask your blessings upon everyone here, that you will uh, open the storehouse of heaven and pour your blessings upon every one of us. We pray for those who are hurting, for those who are discouraged, for those who are having some health issues. We pray for everyone that you will comfort them, that you will bring healing, that you will bring salvation to their soul. Heavenly Father, we confess our infirmities to you this morning, that uh, we may have uh, hearts that are uh, uh, loaded with uh, worry and concern and uh, I think we are all are right now because of the pandemic and we pray that you will promise that uh, those who fall to the right side to the left side but they will not get to you and we want to be under your protective wings uh, today and always Heavenly Father, forgive our sins. We commit ourselves to you. And we ask that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us, will uh, delete the stains of sin in our lives. And we pray that uh, you will dress us with the righteousness of Jesus so the devil will not have excuse to accuse us anymore. Bless us as we listen to the preaching word from the pastor, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give us a good Sabbath, anticipation of the Sabbath with you in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, we want to welcome you here today. As you all know, I'm at the Quincy Church this week. However, I was contacted uh, a couple of days ago by Robert, who was to be doing a presentation this morning. He tells me that there at the prison, uh, there has been quite a number of cases of the COVID-19. 
there were some prisoners that were brought over from San Quentin that had the COVID-19. It appears that no one was aware of it, and now it has spread here at CCC. And uh, Friday, I was told that there's over 100 cases there, and the number uh, continues to rise. But because Robert works at the front lines, he is being exposed on a regular basis, and he'll have to care for these patients being a nurse there for quite some time. He has opted to stay away. He doesn't want to infect anyone. Uh, he doesn't want to put anyone at risk, and so he will not be coming in. So instead of putting this at the last minute on someone else's lap, we decided to record today's video. So though I am in Quincy, uh, I'm here with you all as well. I would invite you to bow your heads as we speak with our Lord. Lord in heaven, we come before you this morning thanking you once again for the opportunity you give us to open your word and to connect with you. We pray for your guidance now. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. A study was done at the end of the 19th century in an orphanage in North America. Now, it didn't start off as a study. The staff in the orphanage were attempting to care for all the children they had. But this particular orphanage received many infant babies that had been left without parents, that had been abandoned by their mothers, or that at some way or another they had lost their parents. And they fell under the responsibility of the state, and they were being raised here, taken care of here, in this orphanage. Now, the orphanage staff did everything in their strength to take care of all their children, all ages, but the largest number of children they had were these infants. They were too many for the staff to really spend a lot of time with, but the staff worked diligently to change their diapers, to feed them on time, to keep them warm, to supply all of their physical needs, but they discovered that something was happening. The administration of the hospital discovered that they had a large number of babies that were dying, a high mortality rate. Now, it was the early years of the 19th century, so it was not unusual to lose babies. However, the number was too high. And so the administration wondered, what can we do? They brought in the staff. They spoke with them. They said, what can we do? And one of the nurses said, I believe I know what the problem is. We are working to care for all the babies, but we can't hold them for long periods of time. We can't cuddle with them. We can't hug them. They need this. They need to experience love, not just see that we're changing their diapers and giving them their milk. They need to experience love. So the hospital administration then sent out advertisements to the town asking for volunteers, individuals who could donate time to come in and spend with these babies. The job would include holding the babies, cuddling the babies, showing the babies that they were loved. The program was begun. Several people in the community volunteered. They spent a few hours um, on weekends. Others would come in during the week. They would spend an hour here, an hour there, holding babies. Now, once the program began, the administration saw that the mortality rate started to drop. And after a little while, after there was a significant number of volunteers spending time holding the babies, the mortality rate almost disappeared. Almost all of the babies were saved. They were saved because though the staff was doing everything in their power, though they, sh they showed their love for these children, changing them, caring for them, keeping them warm, doing everything, doing their laundry, everything the babies needed, 
the time didn't allow for them to sit and show the babies love with just holding them for an hour, two hours. They couldn't do it, but the volunteers could. And the babies were able to experience love in a way that they could understand. Now, if the babies were older and they understood what was happening, they would probably be very thankful for what the staff was doing for them, but the babies didn't understand. It wasn't until someone was holding them and they were experiencing love that they understood. The volunteers provided the experience of love in a way that the babies could understand it. Their time, their closeness was what the babies were able to understand. The Lord desired to show the world love in a way that the world could understand it, in a way that they could receive God's love. The Bible tells us that God didn't just watch us, didn't just provide things from heaven, but rather that God the Father sent Jesus, that the Bible tells us is God himself, and he became one of us, dwelt among us, so that we could experience the love of God in a way that we could understand. We look at scripture in John chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came to show us the love of God. He became one of us. He lived among us. He died for us. He came to show us the love of God in a way that we could understand it. I would invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 34. In John chapter 13, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is the chapter where Jesus actually washes their feet in the communion service. But beginning in verse 34, he tells them something very important. John chapter 13, verse 34. And it says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus wanted his disciples to learn yet another lesson, that they should love one another, just as he loved them. We look at him further speaking to them in John chapter 15. In verse 12, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He has similar words in verse 17 of the same chapter. These things I command you, that you love one another. Jesus sought to teach his disciples to love one another as he loved them. Now the question is, did the disciples learn this lesson? You know, an interesting fact is that the word love does not appear in the book of Acts at all. The four Gospels speak to us about the life of Jesus. The Acts of the Apostles, the fifth book of the New Testament, the second book written by Luke, this book tells us about the life of the Apostles, what they did. But in the entire book, the word love 
is never used. The Acts of the Apostles has 28 chapters. It has 1,007 verses. But in all of those verses, in all of those chapters, the word love is never used. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. He is also the writer of the Gospel of Luke. And he uses the word love various times in the Gospel of Luke. Many times, most of the time, he is quoting Jesus. Jesus is using the word love. And he is quoting Jesus. He uses it many times. But not in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, he doesn't use it at all, not even once. So how can we know if the disciples learned this lesson when the word love is not even used in the book at all? How do we know if the disciples learned their lesson? Well, we know they learned their lesson because we find various writers outside of the Bible speaking about the early church of the apostles. One of the most profound comments made regarding the early church came from the lips of a man called Aristides. Now, it is believed that Aristides was sent to spy out the Christian church by the Roman emperor Hadrian. Now, at this time, Christians were not well accepted. They were different than others. In fact, in the book of Acts, we find some people who were against the apostles. They were adversely opposing the apostles and the early Christians. And in the city of Thessalonica, they said this about them. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. They didn't want them there. These people were turning everything topsy-turvy. They didn't want them there. The Christians were causing all kinds of disturbances. Their way of doing things was foreign to the cultures in the Roman Empire. You see, the Jews had some similar beliefs to them, but the Jews kept to themselves. They didn't go around trying to spread their religion. They kept to themselves, but the Christians, they were trying to share their beliefs. The book of Acts also speaks of that in Acts chapter 8, Beginning in verse 1, it says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region. Those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. The Bible is telling us that the Christians didn't sit idle. When the persecution broke out, they went everywhere spreading the gospel. On top of that, the Romans came to see Christians as atheists. Now, we Christians, we'd say, well, that's ridiculous. How could Christians be called atheists? But the whole world at that time believed in a pantheon of gods, in a multitude of gods, different gods for different things. And here were Christians saying, no, there aren't gods. There's only one God. Those gods don't exist. And so the Romans, the Greeks, were saying, well, you guys don't believe in the gods. You're atheists. In addition to that, Christians taught that you are not to bow down and worship any images. But in those days, the making of images because of the multitude of gods in the different regions, there were different gods. Yes, there were gods that were accepted by the Greeks. There were gods that were accepted by the Romans. They were the same gods as the Greeks. They just changed the names. And then in the different cultures, the different nations that were within the Roman Empire, they had their own gods. They even saw the emperor as a god, and everyone worshipped them, and they made statues of these gods, and they would bow down and offer prayers and worship these gods. And here were Christians coming and saying, no, you can't bow down and worship anything. And they were teaching people not to worship images, and the making of images was a big business in those days. 
So now they were attacking the livelihood of some people. And so these people didn't like it. In fact, we find in the city of Ephesus, in the book of Acts, there was a riot that broke out because the Christians were ruining the business for image makers. In addition to that, the Christians were considered cannibals. How could Christians be considered cannibals? Well, it was because of the Lord's Supper. You see, Christians went around saying that they were drinking the blood of Jesus. And they were eating his flesh. You're eating the flesh of someone? You're drinking the blood of someone? You guys are cannibals. And so the Roman Empire considered Christians cannibals. The Christians were causing all kinds of problems. Furthermore, Christians were considered disloyal to the Roman government. Well, why? Because in some parts of the government, or some parts of the empire, the emperor was considered a god, and people would bow down and worship the emperor. In fact, in some cities, in order for people to be right with the city government, they had to offer a, an amount of salt every year. And it had to be offered in a ceremony that worshipped the emperor. And here were Christians who would not worship images. On top of that, they would not accept the emperor as a god, and they would not worship, and they would not give the amount of salt. You see, salt in those days was considered... Uh, money. It had monetary value. This is where we get our word salary. It comes from the Latin word salt, sal, salary, because salt was given to Romans as money. And so they would offer salt in honor of the emperor in a religious service where they showed their loyalty and that they worshiped the emperor, but Christians didn't do it. And so when we add all of this together, we discover the people began to see Christians in a bad light, and Christians were being persecuted. And so Hadrian wanted to know what was happening here, because they were being called disloyal. They were, it was being said that they were against the Roman government. And so it is believed that he sent Aristides to mingle among the Christians, to spend some time with them. Now, Aristides wrote a very long treatise. He, was, he, he sent a report, but the report was so long as the size of a book. It was 17 chapters where he talks about the Christians. And when people read it, they have mixed reports because they're saying, well, wait a minute, he talks extensively about these Christians, but he doesn't paint them in a bad light. In fact, in many areas, it appears that he himself is a Christian. In a certain part of this treatise, Aristides says, Christians walk in all humility and kindness. Falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. In the book of Acts, we don't find the word love not even once but when we look at people who lived during the period, who experienced this early church, look at what they're reporting. They're saying they love one another. In fact, he ends his treatise. This is probably the phrase he is best known for. He says, behold how they love one another. Jesus commanded his disciples to love one another just as he loved them. Did they learn this lesson? The book of Acts does not use the word love, but when we look at evidence, when we look at people that are writing about the early church, we find that they are talking about the disciples as people who loved one another. Celsus was a second century Greek philosopher. He was an open opponent of the early Christian church. He penned many pages against the church. In one of his books, he wrote trying to make fun of them. He was mocking the early church, 
And this is what he says about them. He says, these Christians love each other even before they are acquainted. This was a person who was against the church. And what's the worst thing he could say? They love each other even before they know each other. Tertullian. He was a prolific early Christian author from the city of Carthage. He reported in one of his books that the Romans spoke about Christians. And the Romans would exclaim, see how they love one another? This was strange for them. How could they love the, one another like this? This was strange for the Romans, he reports. Clement, Clement was a Christian theologian from Alexandria. He describes early Christians with these words. He impoverishes himself out of love, so that he is certain he may never overlook a brother in need. In describing the members of the early church, several Greek philosophers, Christian writers, Roman historians have said the same thing over and over again. Hey, these Christians, they truly love one another. Justin Martyr, a lot of folks know Justin Martyr, Justin Martyr was an early Christian. He had learned from the apostles. He was an early Christian, and he had many, many students that he taught Christianity. Well, he was persecuted, and his students were persecuted, and he was killed for his belief in Christ. And Justin Martyr, that's where we get the word martyr from. He wrote this, he said, we who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else now bring what we have into a common fund and share it with anyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with the people of another race or country. Now, because of Christ, we live together with such people and pray for our enemies. Romans, Greek historians, Greek philosophers, early Christian historians, they all say the same thing about the early church, that they were people that loved one another. Though the word love is not found at all in the book of Acts, the people, even the enemies, of the church acknowledge that early Christians loved one another. Though the book of Acts does not use the word love, it does express this love. It expresses it in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 44. Acts chapter 2, verse 44, I would invite you to look in your Bibles. While you're looking up Acts chapter 2, verse 44, I'll share with you this statement from the Bible commentary from Matthew Henry on Acts 2.46. He says, see how these Christians love one another? They were concerned for one another, sympathized with one another, and heartedly espoused one another's interest. He spoke about the love that Christians had for one another. And so we begin reading here in Acts 2, verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. When we look at this passage in Acts chapter 2, we see that though the word love is not used anywhere in the book of Acts, through their acts, these people loved one another. They shared all that they had, everything they had in common, one did not keep what he had. He looked at the needs of the other, and he shared because he loved the other. 
we discover when we study the actions of the people in the book of Acts. When we look at everything, their opponents and the people writing about them during that period, what they had to say, we discovered that the apostles learned the lesson Jesus was trying to teach them. They learned to love one another. The Lord is calling us to love in like manner, to love one another and to show the love of God to others in a way that they can understand through our acts, through our attitudes, to show the world the love of God. Throughout the Bible, we find God calling us with his love and asking us to share that with others. He yearns to show us that love. Throughout the Bible, that love is seen over and over again, him calling us in both Old and New Testament. Dwight Nelson in the devotional, The Chosen. He shares an illustration about the Reuben Donnelly Company in Chicago. Now, some years ago, they were sending out some renewals for subscriptions for people who were ordering magazines from them. And they had a large printer that uh, would print the name of the person and what they needed to uh, subscribe to anew, the subscription that was running out. And so to kind of stamp on a postcard, the postcard would pass through, and then a different name would come, and with its information, it would be stamped on it. And the belt would move, the card would, would move, and the new information was printed on the new card, and it would pass. Well, what happened was a spring broke, in this printer, this large industrial printer. And instead of passing from name to name with the different subscriptions that needed to be renewed, the same name remained. And the machine kept running all day. And the cards would pass, but it was stamping the very same name on every card that passed with the very same subscription information. And so that whole load went out. In fact, several loads went out before the people realized what was happening and fixed it. But all of that stuff went out to the mail. And the post office sent it to the address. It took not just a couple of days, but a few weeks before all of the subscription cards came in and the post office was able to process them. In the end, there was 9,734 requests. All were subscription renewal cards, and all were being sent to the same address, to the same person, 9,734 9, requests. Now, they were arriving from the first day a pile came in. The guy got it. He threw it in the trash. He said, why so many? He threw it in the trash. The next day, more came. What is all this? The next day and the next day. And it, they continued to come for several weeks because there were so many of them. And they were piling up. The trash bags were being filled with these requests. So finally, this man who lived out in the country, he jumped into his truck, taking one of the cards with him, he, he drove all the way into town, he stopped, he wrote an entire note along with his card, and he went to the postmaster, and he said, I need you to send this out today, it's got to go out today. He was desperate, it's got to go out today. And the postmaster said, okay, okay, it's no big deal. It was the renewal, because he needed to renew his subscription for National Geographic that had run out. But after receiving 9,734 requests, he finally said, I give up. I will renew it. Please stop sending requests. The man was overwhelmed by the number of reminders. He was overwhelmed that though he had no intention of renewing it, he felt that he had to respond. Uh, just, just stop the mailings. Stop the mailings. Whenever we turn in Scripture, we run headlong into a God who loves us. And over and over and over again, he is telling us that he loves us. In action, in story, in direct words, he is telling us that he loves us. 
And so that we could experience that love of God, he sent Jesus. The life of Jesus showed the love of God. The death of Jesus on Calvary showed even more the depths and the length God is willing to go because he loves us. But that same God who loves us is saying that we need to love one another. He sought to teach his disciples to love one another. But that lesson, he didn't seek to only teach the apostles of old. They learned the lesson. We discover in historical records, we discover through the wording in the book of Acts that they truly loved one another. But he doesn't want that to remain in times past. He wants Christians today to love one another in the same way. He calls you to love others just as Jesus loved us, just as the apostles loved one another. May the Lord bless you all. your actions, the illustrations found in Scripture, and the very words that tell us that you love us. But Lord, you have called us not just to love you because you love us, but to love one another, to view one another as you view us. We pray, Lord, for discernment. We pray that this may be a reality that we may be able to love others as you love them. Not just people we like, not just our closest friends or family, but everyone, Lord. We ask that you may teach us to love one another. We ask that our hearts may be opened to this and that this may be a reality for us all. We pray for a blessing upon all that are here. We pray this in the name of Jesus.